What's up guys, Lore here and on tap for today we're taking a look at Guild Wars 2. This is going to be the first of several videos about Guild Wars 2 just because, well there's there's way too much for me to cover in just one video here. So today I'm going to go through some of the basics about the game as well as a bit of the PvE side of the game. Sort of the open world stuff you can do out in the open, the questing and so on. So right here as you can see, this is my Asura Elementalist. There are uh, five races and eight classes in the game, or professions as they call them in Guild Wars speak. Five races and eight classes. There are human, uh, Norn, which are sort of um, very Celtic-inspired, almost like Viking uh, style. Very, very large humanoid creatures. Uh, Char, which are the big beast-like, uh, I guess like halfway between a cat and a cow sort of thing. Uh, Silvari, which are these plant-like, almost elf-like creatures, and but they're actually plants, so like they've got like twigs and stuff sticking out, off of them all over the place. They're very strange. Uh, and of course, there are the Asura, which are incredibly tiny and incredibly awesome. Uh, if you're wondering why I'm playing an Asura, let me go ahead and show you here real quick. I, I honestly don't think that there is any better reason than that to play the Asura. That is that is amazing. And of course the dance is awesome as well. Anyway, so there are also eight classes. Uh, Elementalist, which is what I'm playing. Uh, it's very, very mage-like. You can switch between different, uh, different elements that you can cast spells from. Uh, and each one of these elements you get different abilities with. Like so. Uh, there is also Warrior, which is about what you would expect. Very, very martial-focused uh, class. Does have a ranged DPS uh, uh, style, I guess you can say. They're able to use... Uh, I don't remember exactly which range, range weapons they're able to use. I believe they can use both pistols and rifles, although I'm not sure off the top of my head. Uh, there's Guardian, which is a very, very tank-focused, very Paladin-like class. Engineer, which is very focused on uh, having like different weapon kits. They're able di like, different kits just in general. They're able to use doing things like throwing grenades uh, or throwing down healing packs, uh, and they can also build like turrets and stuff. Ranger, which is a very hunter-like class. They have pets. Uh, the pets are constantly dead, running around being obnoxious. Uh, but other than that, they're, they're just very hunter-like. I haven't spent a whole ton of time with the Ranger. Even in the beta, I just didn't really like the class very much. Uh, there's Necromancer, which honestly, it plays very, very similar to a Destruction Warlock in, uh, in World of Warcraft. So you have a, an alternate form that you can switch into and do some different stuff in that alternate form. Uh, and otherwise, you're just a general spellcaster. Uh, there's the Thief, which is very roguelike, very sneaking around. Uh, they have some limited stealth ability. Uh, they're also just very, very uh, medium armor, very melee focused, very ranged focused as well. Lots of different stuff you can do with them. Uh, and then there's the Mesmer, which is a bit hard to actually categorize. They're a... Uh, yeah, they're a bit they're a bit tough to actually explain. They're based around having different illusions of themselves that do different things. Uh, they're they're very caster oriented, but they also have a, a couple pretty decent melee focused trees as well. Uh, they range DPS with a great sword, like that's just they're they're very very strange like that. So very very interesting class differences. All of the classes end up feeling very different from each other, which is good. They, you don't end up feeling like any one class is just. Like, uh, for example, Necromancer doesn't feel like Elementalist, but with a pet or something like that, like you would see with the, the Warlocks in, in World of Warcraft. Uh, very, very good class design. I've been very happy with how different each class feels overall. Let's talk about the PvE for a little bit here. Uh, I guess the best place to start is for me to just go ahead and open up the map here and start looking around a bit. You can see there's all sorts of stuff all over the place, little indicators all around... Hang on one second. Shut up. All right. All sorts of stuff all over the place to do. The game is very much focused, the PvE aspect of the game, is very much focused on exploration. You can see there's a whole lot of the world that I have yet to even 
think about going to. There's just stuff all over the place here. And it's very much focused about going out into the world and just finding stuff to do, which is pretty cool. There isn't, like, a specific questing system in this game. You don't, like, walk up to some guy and he's got an exclamation mark over his head and he's like, hey, please go kill five rats because this is really important to me as a person. Nothing like that. You just kind of run around and find stuff to do. So, along those lines, uh, there are, I, I should mention this real quick as well, there are NPCs called scouts. Um, let me see if I can find the indicator for one on my map here. Uh, none of them are particularly showing up at the moment, which is unfortunate. I've probably found all of them in the area. The indicator disappears when you actually speak to one. But they will illuminate a section of your map and show you a direction to go in. So it's not like you're completely aimless wandering around going, I have no idea what I'm, like, there's nothing for me to do. I, don't, I can't find anything. It's not aimless in that regard. It's just basically, the idea is to go out into the world and do stuff out in the world. Um, so let's talk about some of that stuff. So, probably the the best place to start is with these hearts that you see everywhere. Uh, I've completed most of these. There's the, they're like just an outline when you haven't completed one yet. Um, these are as close to quests as you get in this game, I suppose. You basically, you will go to an area and something will pop up that says like, help this guy by doing one of these several things. And you have a bar that fills up as you do any number of stuff in that area. And it's pretty awesome the way that works out, where you end up just sort of like, uh, for example, in this area, one of the things I can do is talk to this golem. And I just randomly pick on some stuff here. And activate them doing different stuff. And whoops, it turns out I actually just killed that one. That's unfortunate. And then I can revive him and fix him back up again. And that's, that's part of the quest, uh, the, the renown heart, the task in the area. That's just one of several things I can do in this particular area for that particular uh, task, though. Like, like I said, I've already completed it. But I can also come over here and there's this, like, golem chest that I could play. Uh, chest, excuse me. Uh, there's, like, powering up these power down golems. There's something I can do to help out with that, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's been a while. This is, like, one of the first uh, renown hearts that you can actually work on. One of the first tasks that you can actually do. Um, let me see if I can find one of... Ah, here. Here's another one of these guys over here. These golem assistants. Uh, oh, I've, apparently I've already finished, so I can't, I can't have him do that again. So, that's unfortunate. But you're using different items and just sort of noticing the effects that happen on you. It, it's a really interesting take on generic questing, because it means that you're, you're doing one of several bunches of anything to complete a quest. And it also helps very well with uh, sort of bringing the storytelling into what you're actually doing. Instead of having like a whole big box of quest text that pops up and goes, oh, you, you, know, you gotta do this whole thing because, you know, we, we're really working really hard on all this stuff over here and you gotta, you gotta help us out because uh, just go do something with this toolbox. It's nothing like that. It's literally just you are acting out the storyline. Your character is the story, not, you know, something that happened in the area before. That's not what's, that's not what's important here. Which makes the, the, the story of the game really it folds it into what you're actually doing. Uh, part of that as well is with these random events, and it unfortunately doesn't look like there's any that's happening right around me at the moment. I'm going to wander around for a minute while I talk and try to find one. Uh, there's these random events that will tie into that as well that also help a lot with the storytelling, uh, which work kind of like kind of like quests, again, in that you have a dedicated uh, goal that you're supposed to be working towards. But they're very, very dynamic. They just kind of, oh, you're in this area, and this thing is happening in this area. So something will pop up on your screen and say, hey, you know, help this guy do this thing, or retake this area, or, uh, like, go along with this, this escort, escort this guy to go do something. There's all sorts of, I'm going to try and find one, hopefully, as I continue to wander around the world here. Should I also mention, as we're just wandering around here, that the game world is absolutely beautiful. Like, it looks visually stunning. This is one of the most beautiful games I have ever played, and it still manages to keep fantastical elements. Like, obviously, I'm a tiny little dwarf-looking thing. Oh, we've got an event over here. Uh, it looks like it might actually finish before I can get over there. But in this case, there's a whole bunch of Inquest, which is a, a faction of uh, a, a faction of Ashura that is generally, generally poor people. Yeah, there, we've succeeded the event. Generally... I say poor, I don't mean in that they, they have no money, I mean that they're bad people. They're bad guys, basically. 
They were trying to take over that lab, and we were able to fight them off. I arrived just in the nick of time to save everything, by which I mean I arrived just in the nick of time to uh, not actually do anything at all. But still, there's these sort of random dynamic events that can happen around the world. Uh, it, it's just really cool the way everything is tied together. Uh, let's, let's hop back into the map for a second. I'm going to head this way while I talk, because there's something over here I want to show you. There's also... Uh, exploring around the map, there's these waypoints you can unlock. That's the fast travel system. Uh, so like, uh, let's see here. I'll just jump over here real quick. This is how travel works in this game, is you just jump from one point to another. There's no mounts or anything like that. Uh, nothing that particularly would make you run faster other than like short-term boosts. Like I can, I can use a buff on myself that gives me swiftness, which makes me run faster. But that has a cooldown and it doesn't last permanently. I can actually, I actually have several different ways I can give myself swiftness as this particular uh, class setup. Uh, but that's uh, that's unusual, and usually you you can only get very short term boosts of speed. Uh, so there's just sort of that's just part of the exploration is finding the different waypoints for fast travel. There's also just points of interest that you just get near something and you get a little bit of XP for having discovered that particular location. So that's kind of cool. It helps uh, reinforce the exploration aspect of the game. There's also vistas, and I love vistas. And there's one right up over here. I've already found it. You see that little thing up there? That is the vista. And so what I have to do, it's, it's literally part of figuring out how to get to that. How do I get to that vista up there to get credit for it? So in this particular one, I'll give you a little spoiler here. This one isn't a terribly difficult one, but it shows as a good example. I have to climb up the side of this building here, come up this thing, and then there's these platforms here that I have to jump on, and then I'm able to run over here and pick up this vista, and I am treated with uh, XP if I hadn't already done it, and also this little cutscene that just sort of flies around and shows off a bit of the area, just a little bit of a... Uh, yeah, just showing off how good the world looks. Like I was saying earlier, the world just looks really, really good. So it flies around and just shows a bit of that. Pretty nice. And it's it's awesome to me because I really love that element of jump up on top of this stuff. Find your way up on top of things. And that's a relatively simple vista. There are some that are a lot more complicated to actually get to. And they do actually have uh, full-on jump puzzles. I'm going to head over to one here uh, that's nearby that I've done before so uh, there's a little bit of a puzzle to the jumping to the jump puzzles in that you have to kind of figure out what you're supposed to do uh, I've already figured this one out so um, so yeah I'm, I should be able to get through it relatively quickly but it's still uh, actually I, it's it, there's it's highly possible that I won't be able to get through it at all because it's actually relatively difficult and I'm gonna be talking while I'm doing the same thing while I'm doing this thing as well uh, so there are jump puzzles which are these hidden hidden puzzles out in the world try and get away from that thing. I don't want to have to fight it. Uh, this one starts over here. And this is literally like just the tiny beginning. It's it's pretty much just platforming. It's platforming in an MMO. And it's interesting. I've got to jump, jump across here. And this is going to get more complicated as I go. Jumping across these different places. Hop up here. Oh, just barely made that. Uh, I'm actually going to turn on swiftness for a second to get through this next part here. Makes it a little bit easier, but in some cases, but a little bit harder in others. There, I've gotten across that, and that's that's just getting to the jump puzzle, right? Okay, that that's I should point that out. This is not actually part of the jump puzzle. This is the easy. This is just getting to it. Uh, I'll try and jump across here real quick. This is the part where I have to focus for a moment. It's very hard to do this while talking. I am actually going to activate some swiftness here for a second. So I can make sure I get across that. Okay, now I'm able to get to the actual jump puzzle. And this is just one. I'm pretty sure every single zone has a jump puzzle in it. But this is just one of them in the Metrica province here. And you can see there's some other people trying to do it as well. So again, more jumping. You can see now I'm, I'm very, very far above anything else. I'm trying to get across here. Uh... It's, it's fortunate that there's a lot of other people here trying to do it, so I can hopefully actually show uh, show them failing at it instead of just constantly failing at it myself. Now they get to the hard part. You see someone already fell off over there. There's actually gusts of wind at this part that are, that char just fell off. There's gusts of wind that you have to try and dodge while getting across this thing. And what's unfortunate for those guys is there's actually another part 
uh, back a little bit farther that I don't know if they realize or not. There's actually another part of the jump puzzle over here that you have to go through, sort of hopping down from there to get attuned to a portal over on the other side before you can actually even go through it. And there's several, there's actually three different legs of this, getting from one portal to another in this particular jump puzzle. Getting through the whole thing, honestly, takes, uh, even if you ace everything, it would still probably take you a good ten minutes or so to get through the whole thing, just because of how much is actually there. Let's see, we'll watch these guys trying to get through. There's actually another one over on the other side, and the guy just fell off there. Uh, I'll try to get through it in a second here, but... Uh, for the moment, we'll just we'll just watch. And actually, I should also point out that on top of all this stuff, on top of all of the you know jumping around and everything that I'm having to do, really high up in the air here. On top of the the tasks or renown hearts, whatever you want to call them, uh, there's also these skill points that you can earn out in the out in the open area. It actually kind of takes the place of in Guild Wars One, you were able to uh, how do I put it? In Guild Wars 1, you were able to earn new abilities by doing certain things out in the world. You'd have, like, a task. Like, I remember one in particular for the Ranger early on. You would have a, a almost like a quest you had to go through to earn your pet that you could summon. And then you earn the ability to resurrect that pet so that it wasn't just dead all the time. They kind of took that in a different direction in Guild Wars 2. You now have skill points. So if I jump into, oops, if I jump into my slot skills here... Uh, you earn skill points, and you can spend those on all sorts of stuff. So, like, uh, here's one that I bought. It's an arcane blast or arcane wave sort of thing. It's a short, short range arcane AOE effect. Uh, this one down here, I've got a teleport. Uh, there's a, another one that just does some damage. Arcane power here. Next five attacks do critical damage. All sorts of different abilities. A lot of them are utility focused as well. So, um, here's a here's a good one. A uh, cantrip that morphs me into an invulnerable vaporous mist for a brief time. I've actually got that one equipped at the moment. So you can see I, I just turn into something that's invulnerable and I'm able to move around for just a couple of seconds. So that's pretty cool. They also have uh, weapon skills. I should point this out. Uh, each different weapon that you use has a different skill set. So, for example, I'm a, I'm a staff elementalist. But if I were to go in here, and I believe I have a couple of daggers that I can equip real quick. I now have a completely different set of skills than what I had before. And that applies to all of my different elements as well. Uh, elements being the, uh, the, where did my staff go? There it is. The unique uh, gameplay element for Elementalists. So that's that's really cool that there's all, there's all these different skills you can actually get from having your different weapons equipped. Uh, and there's also traits, something I haven't really dug into too deeply just yet because I'm only level uh, 26 at this point. Haven't really had a whole time, a whole lot of time to mess with them. But they kind of seem to work similar to kind of like a talent tree. They have a base, uh, a, a, a couple of base things that just increase for having more points in them. You can unlock certain stuff like here. I've been spending trait points in Fire Magic. I've unlocked Flame Barrier, which uh, I have a 20% chance to cause burning whenever a foe attacks me in melee. So uh, when I'm when I'm in my Fire Element and I get a hit, there's a 20% chance for me to put a damage over time effect on them. And there's also these uh, different uh, major, I forget what they call them, major traits, something like that, yeah, major traits, that you can choose one of those for your particular, like once you've unlocked a major trait slot for fire, I can choose one of, there's six of them that you can choose at the first major trait slot. When I get up to level 30, there's actually uh, 12 total that you can actually pick from. So that system, it seems a little bit complicated. I do feel like it's a little bit overly complicated for what it is, for how early it is introduced to you. And I was talking about this a bit on my stream a lot during one of the beta weekend events as well. It does seem a little bit overly complicated for for like someone who's just getting into it. But it does do a pretty good job of limiting how far you can go by level. I actually can't unlock the next set of traits until I get to level 40. So is it level 40 or level 30? I believe it's level 40. Uh, so I'm actually having to multitask a little bit and look at different stuff. Uh, it does end up working out to be pretty decent there. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the slot skills, like I was saying, you earn the skill points out by doing the different stuff. You also earn skill points just for leveling up, but you can earn extra ones out in the open. I actually have enough to unlock a new skill. I'll have to look and figure out what new skill I want to unlock later. So that is pretty cool. And on top of all, all of this exploration stuff, you also have your personal story that you're going through, uh, and that's that's the closest hmm, 
that I, I would actually just call that questing. That is that is pretty much just questing, but it's very very interspersed between everything else. Everybody has every every race has a major uh, or excuse me a, a starting zone. Every race has their own starting zone, and your personal story just kind of leads you through the different zones more or less. And it is an interesting story. Like I've been focusing a lot on the story aspect and the PVE aspect of the game thus far because I am actually pretty interested in my story. Another really nice thing about it is that as you're creating your character, there are three different um, story options that you get while you're while you're creating your character so uh for example my asura here let me try and remember here uh i had to choose my mentor like who my specific mentor was i had to choose what my first invention was and i had to choose uh what was the other one that i had to choose i don't remember it off the top of my head at the moment but there were three different things that I had to choose, and it's the same for all the different races. Each race has three different t things that they have to choose. Like the humans, for example, at one point they have to choose what their biggest regret was, and one of them is like, oh, I never found my dead sister. And another one was like, oh, I grew up as an orphan, that's so sad. And the other one was like, I never joined the circus, which to me doesn't really seem like it's in the same league as the other ones, but whatever. It's uh, it's just the different story elements that you can go through, which essentially means, just sort of tying all this in here, essentially means that every character you, you create, I can create three different Asuras, which I'm probably going to, because they're awesome. Let me, let me, let me point out another reason that they're awesome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm probably going to make three different Asuras, and I can get three different totally unique questing experiences, or, or story experiences, by making three different Asuras. And I don't mean like, oh, well, it's just a different combination, it's really the same stuff I've done before, but it's three different combinations that it, I haven't done it in this order or something like that. No, I mean, I can have three completely different story experiences on one Asura, or on, 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 on the Asura, I should say. So that's that's really really cool to me that they made it. So if you just happen to really like Asura like I do, then I can just make a bunch of them, and I don't feel like I'm wasting time not experiencing new content. I'm going through the same stuff over and over and over again because I'm I'm not. I'm doing something different every time. So that's really cool. Uh, as I try to get across here, let's uh, let's talk for a moment about. Uh, I, I do want to mention something about the XP curve actually. Um, it, it feels a little bit off. Oops, got hit by that thing there. I, and I fell off. Hooray! It does actually port me back to the beginning. So, um, I believe I can actually jump to one of the later... Oh, no, I can't. I have to go through Windy Station first. Uh, so, anyway, let's talk a little bit about the XP curve. It does feel a little bit weird in the lower levels, and a lot of people I've seen complaining about this, and there's been a lot of discussion about it around the internet so far as well. The issue that it currently has with the XP curve is in, in the lower levels again. Uh, right now, things seem a little bit too focused on the dynamic events. The dynamic events give you tons of XP. They're, they're worth more than the tasks or renown hearts. They're worth more than anything else. And so what that means is... Oh, crap. What that means is if you get lucky, if you just happen to be lucky enough to come across a ton of dynamic events as you're actually uh, just running around the world doing everything else, then you're fine. Then, okay, I just happen to have a dynamic event at pretty much every Renown Heart that I went to. That's cool. I'm ready to move on to the next zone, or I, I'm, I'm staying in, in line with my personal story quest and so on. That was terrible. If you're, uh, if you're not lucky enough to get all those, you end up feeling a little bit behind in the first couple of zones. You get to a point where you're like, okay, I, I actually can't do my next personal story quest, and I can't do the next Renown Hearts because everything is too high level for me. Which means you end up just sort of... Accelerate. That was almost bad. You end up just sort of running around in circles. Uh, just Apparently that's really hard for me right now. Again, I am talking while trying to do this, which is a bit distracting. But anyway, you end up just sort of running around in circles trying to find random events to be able to advance your, your character, to be able to get higher XP so that you can earn higher levels so that you can move on to doing the next step in the Renown Hearts or your personal story quest. And that feels a little, feels a little bit iffy. Like, I, I would rather be able to just move on as a standard, and if I found a whole bunch of dynamic events as I'm working around, uh, 
probably a good thing that I keep failing at this because I forgot I had to come down here and do this thing. Uh, I, basically, I guess a, a good way to put this was I was 100% finished. I had completed everything there was in both my main city and my uh, and my the first starting zone when I when I was getting to the end. Like I completed everything in Radisum, which is my main city. And Metrica Province, which is the first zone for Asuras. And I was still not able to... I was not at a high enough questing point yet to be able to move on to the next zone. And that feels a bit off to me. I ended up having to run around and just do a whole bunch of gathering. And do a whole bunch of... Uh, in fact, I should actually quit messing around with this thing and show you guys some of the gathering here in a second. But I ended up having to do a whole bunch of gathering, which does give XP. And the trade skills do give XP as well. I was using that to sort of bridge myself a little bit. And then just a whole bunch of wandering around in circles in areas that I'd already explored, right? It's not like I'm exploring a new new part of the world at that point. I, I already had been through that whole area. Uh, I'm just wandering around hoping to find something going on so that I can get some experience points. So that I can continue to be bad at this jumping puzzle. No, so that I can continue to move on to the next, the next area. So that was a little bit weird. I'm going to quit messing around with this jump puzzle now and fall to my death. All right, go me. Fantastic. Let's jump over here real quick. Uh, and I can, I can run around doing some of the gathering nodes. Fortunately, the, the thing about the XP curve being off, the fortunate bit that I should should point out is that does evaporate once you get into the higher zones. It does eventually move you on to... Like, basically, your, your personal story quest will move you into a point where you end up going into other races, level 15 to 20 zones, which means that all of a sudden you have a whole bunch more content that you're actually able to do. You're actually suddenly, oh, I can actually just do all of these quests and all these, or excuse me, all these renowned hearts and all of the vistas and everything that's hidden over here. You suddenly have a whole bunch more content available to you. And uh, to be completely fair, I could have actually chosen to move on to another, uh, to just go to another race's starting zone. Uh, but I, I didn't. I, I, it just feels a little bit awkward to me to have to go to another race's starting zone at the start. It's not something that I find particularly compelling gameplay. Being attacked by a jaguar here. So, as you can see, I'm gathering nodes here. And I'm actually going to follow this guy that's in front of me to try and show off something else that's interesting about this game. You don't need a particular gathering profession. Hopefully this guy's doing what I think he is. You don't need a particular gathering profession to actually gather in this game. Everybody can gather anything as long as you have the appropriate tools equipped. Uh, it doesn't look like he's actually doing what I was hoping he was. Oh well. The the more important thing here... If I'm lucky, maybe he was and he was just fighting this thing first. Let's fight this off for a moment. Uh, the, the, the most important thing about how the gathering actually works in this game is that every single gathering node is unique to you. So like, I just got that thing but now this guy is able to mine it as well. He it shows as being used on my screen, obviously, because I've already mined that thing. But he was able to mine from it. It showed on his screen as being still active and usable, which is awesome. It means that while I'm around just deciding, eh, I need to go gather some stuff, I need to go pick up some stuff to continue working on my trade skills or whatever, I, I don't have to worry about, oh, that guy was fighting that thing, so I need to... I need to leave it alone because, like, he was fighting something to clear up to that node, so that's his node, and I don't, I don't want to have to steal it from him. Or I don't have to worry about me fighting something off to try and get to a particular node, and then someone else comes up and steals it. It's a really, really, really nice touch that basically just makes it so I, it just gets rid of a whole lot of the grief that happens in other games like World of Warcraft, where you're running around and, okay, I found a copper node, and I'm going to clear off this, this couple of things so that I can mine it, and, oh, someone else just wandered up and stole my copper note. Nothing like that can possibly happen in Guild Wars, which is really nice. It's a very, very nice touch. So that that is pretty cool. The crafting, um, I'm not going to go super in-depth with the crafting at the moment, just because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It seems very, very deep, and it does have this interesting uh, discovery system. I may end up covering that in more detail in another video. But for now... I just felt it was important to point out. And it's also important to note that I'm getting XP from doing this too. So that's an interesting thing. One other thing I should probably note is that I am I'm level 26, right? Everything around me is like level 10 at the moment. I am level 26. I am not in an area that 
in other MMOs would be tuned for me. Like, nothing around here should be stuff that I would want to do. But Guild Wars has a really, really ingenious downscaling system in place. It basically means that when you're in an area, every area has a maximum level assigned to it. So I'm actually, if you look in the lower left here, you can see my level is level 26, but it says your level has been adjusted to match the area you are in. And I've been downscaled to level 9, which is the maximum level that you can be in this area. Which A, means that all of the all of the content in this area is still challenging to me, but more importantly, that means that they can reward me appropriately for doing the content in the area. Because this is all still a challenge to me, like, it, there's nothing that I'm just straight up able to go, oh, well, whatever, I can just mind-numbingly roll my way through it. Um, I can get stuff, that wasn't a good example, but I can get stuff from killing creatures or doing events or whatever, I can get stuff that's actually still appropriate to my level at level 26. It'll still drop gear, it'll still drop items and and so on that are appropriate for some. Oh, I missed that guy. That are appropriate for someone at level 26 off of these you know level seven mobs that I'm running around killing at the moment. That's really really cool to me. It means that if I have a friend doing something. I can, levels just don't matter, essentially, is what it comes down to. Sure, I'm, I'm still able to, like, get more options as leveling up. I'm still able to get more get more character power as I'm leveling up. But if I have a friend who's playing and I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, let's, let's play together. I can just go do the same stuff as him in the same zone, and we're both getting the exact same thing out of it. I can go, like, maybe not so much if he made another... To my ooze -booze. My oh. Actually, I wonder if I can... Interesting. Cool. Alright, so now we have a, a group event up over here. I'm <laughs> Again, I'm going to get there just in time for it to die. Uh, but here we have a, a, a world boss, a group event world boss. Maybe I can get there just in time to at least see it. Uh, it doesn't look like it. They, yep, they killed it before I got there. Anyway... So what I was saying was, it, you're you're able to do stuff, and like, if I could have gotten up over here to this thing, that was like a level 9 boss. It's over here, it's dead now. Uh, it was like a level 9 boss. There was tons of people in this area working on it. I should also point out that groups don't matter in this game. You can group, you can party up with people, but that doesn't have any effect on loot. Everybody's loot is personal, so if you helped kill something, you can get loot off of it. If I'm, if I'm like, if I was doing this quest in this area, I would be able to help people kill these things that they're working on. Like right here, a whole bunch of us are killing this red ooze. We would all have gotten quest credit for that, or renown credit for that. That sort of gameplay is just awesome. It's basically Guild Wars is looking at stuff like, why why do we have to make sure that everybody is in their own party? That doesn't matter. Why, why, why would we even worry about that? Really, really cool to see. Very nice the way they've they've put it together. It really just makes the whole experience very fluid, and it doesn't make you upset to see other players. And see, like right there, I just killed a level. What was that? Like level six ooze, and I got a level twenty-two medium armor chest piece off of it because it was still a challenge for me. It wasn't every bit as challenging for me to kill that as it would be for me to kill something at like level twenty, at level fifteen, any other level because I've been downscaled to level ten. Obviously, I have more abilities than I would have had then, but I didn't use them there, so it didn't really matter. Really, really cool the way this is all set up. Here, we got a level 8 mosquito. I'm not going to instantly one-shot this level 8 mosquito because I am level 26. It's going to take me a second to kill it. I'm actually only two levels above that at the moment. Really nice the way that's worked out. Uh, one other thing I want to show you guys real quick, just because uh, I feel like I, I should for the sake of clarity. Let me teleport over here real quick. I want to show you guys the underwater combat. Uh, this is one aspect of the game that I really don't like. Oh, and in fact, we actually have a, an underwater event going on over here. I really am not a huge fan of the underwater combat. It works, it functions, but there's a couple of problems I have with it. First of all, I actually have no idea how far away that thing is from me at the moment because, and that just comes down to the fact that I don't have a point of reference. I can't see what's going on nearby, so it's it's hard for me to tell what's going on. I don't is like is that guy hitting me? I can't I can't actually tell. Uh, and the dodging is a bit weird underwater. Like it'll tend to randomly send you in a, a direction up or down that doesn't necessarily make sense. Like yes, I'm still going left to right appropriately, but the vertical direction is a bit weird. I also seem to end up just doing a whole lot of auto attacking when I'm underwater. 
you do use different weapons underwater, and there's nothing like breath or anything you have to worry about. But ultimately, it just seems to have come down to... I don't really like it very much. I don't know. It's hard to describe. It's, it's something that just feels off in the game. Like, I'm... Uh, yeah, it, it's hard for me to really describe exactly what the, the problem with it is. Because it's something that... F it's a feel thing. Like, it might not be able to... You might, it might not show very well in the video footage, but this feels like there I randomly went down when I dodged. I don't I don't know why I went down at all. That doesn't make any sense. It's really, really frustrating. Like, I'm using a ranged weapon at the moment. It's really frustrating with a melee weapon because it's just so hard to be able to tell, like, is this thing next to me? Is it in front of me? Is it behind me? I can't tell half the time because it's just weird the way it works out. So not a huge fan of the underwater combat. They definitely made a very real try at making it interesting, but it just doesn't seem to have worked out well in practice, at least for me. It's just not not something that I enjoy. So anyway, uh, overall, the game, I, I should say, I do really, really enjoy this game. I have been streaming it quite a bit. I've been playing it quite a bit. It's a lot of fun. I definitely highly recommend picking it up. Uh, even if you're only going to play it for a month, even if you're only going to play it every so often, just something super casually, that's fine. You you can, because there's no monthly fee, and because levels don't matter, you can just do whatever. Like, you, you don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have to rush to maximum level in this game, because that's where all the content is. Because, uh, I should point this out, there isn't really a major end game in the game, other than what you're already doing. Like, the end game is just basically getting to new zones, doing different stuff in new zones. That's pretty much all that is. There, we've completed that particular event, and so everyone in the area that was working on it got credit for it. And you're also graded on, like, a, a gold... I don't know what that was about. Uh, you're, you're graded on, like, a gold, silver, or bronze rating uh, based on how much you actually helped out with the event. So it's not like you can just run up and touch something and, oh, cool, I got, I got event credit. But anyway... Uh, you can play this game extremely casually and have no problem with it at all. And that's something that's really, really nice about Guild Wars 2 and why I can definitely recommend to everyone to pick up this game. Because you don't you don't have to spend a whole ton, ton, a ton of time on it. It's not an MMO that you have to pick up and play and feel like it's another job or like you have to just... I don't have to be spending tons of time on Guild Wars 2. I've bought it. I've spent all the money that I ever have to spend on it. I'm going to go into the... Uh, cash shop in another video, but uh, I, I don't have to spend any more money on this game than I already have, and if I want to spend a whole ton of time in it, cool, I can. If I don't, if I just want to pick it up and play it every once in a while, that's also totally fine. You don't, there, there's no limits in, or limitations in how much time you're spending on the game to be able to enjoy what the game has to offer, and that is really, really fun and refreshing to me. Uh, it, it may be that there are certain things in the PvP later on, especially in the structured PvP, where you want to spend a whole bunch of time just to be good at it, but it's more along the lines of, I want to spend a ton of time on this because I'm enjoying playing it, not because I have to spend a ton of time on this in order to be competitive at all. That's really, really cool to me. And it, again, it's because it's literally because they have the entire game set up in a way that they can do that. It's the, the the way the game is built allows them to have it be something where you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time on stuff. So anyway, I'm going to wrap up this video. Uh, this actually went longer than I was expecting it to, and that was just me saying, okay, we'll just talk about some of the basics of the, the PvE uh, because I'm going to, I'm going to have to split this up into multiple, multiple videos. So I'm going to wrap this video up. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, there will be more videos on Guild Wars 2 in the future. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and call them like different parts of the on tap, the overall on tap for Guild Wars 2, because it is an MMO and I don't think that I could reasonably explain everything that is important. I haven't even touched the PvP in this video or the crafting or several other things. So keep an eye out for more on tap of Guild Wars 2 in the future. I'll see you guys later.